One of the biggest rivalries in tech is that between Intel and AMD. It's been going on for nearly 50 years. You can't talk about desktop PCs without talking about the difference between Intel and AMD or AMD and Intel. It's same for laptops, same for servers. So in this video, I wanna talk about how this rivalry started, follow the history of it all, including the transition to 64 bits, and at the very end, give you a checklist of things that you need to consider when you're opting to buy a processor from one manufacturer or the other. Okay, if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so let's get into this. So where did Intel come from? Well, it was founded in 1968 by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. That's Gordon Moore of uh, Moore's Law, as you've probably heard of. And they were both former executives from Fairchild Semiconductor. Originally, it was called NM for Noyce and Moore. Uh, and they purchased the right to the word Intel, uh, short for Integrated Electronics. So that's where we have the name today that's been around for many, many decades since then. And their big moment when they put themselves on the map was when they released the first microprocessor, the 4004, uh, introduced in 1971, had 2,300 transistors. Just imagine how many transistors we use today in the billions. Uh, 2,300, it could do 60,000 operations per second. The company then followed with the 8008 and eventually the 16-bit 8086, and that's where we talk about the x86 architecture. This is where the roots come from. And that effectively launched the personal computer revolution, which we will talk about quickly in a moment. Now, AMD, funnily enough, was founded just one year after Intel in 1969. Again, a group of executives from Fairchild Semiconductor. They met together uh, in someone's living room with an intent of starting their own company and things just launched very quickly from there. Now, when Intel was selected by IBM for its 8088 processor, which is a variant of the 8086, uh, for the first PC in 1991, this decision established the x86, uh, as I just mentioned, 86 at the end there, as a de facto for PC processors. Uh, but IBM had a condition that Intel would also provide a second source manufacturer for its x86 microprocessors. So Intel and AMD entered into a 10 year long uh, technology exchange agreement which allowed each company to become a second source manufacturer of the semiconductor product developed by the other. So Intel could have made AMD products uh, that way round as well. So it was a bilateral kind of thing. Now all wasn't plain sailing unfortunately. After a few years of working together Intel decided to no longer cooperate with AMD on the 80386. Effectively of course by having this second source agreement and sharing the technology they created a rival, basically, and that's what happened. And so in 1987, AMD invoked an arbitration because they had a contract with Intel. The result of that was that Intel cancelled the agreement completely. And then there was lots of back and forth with legal battles. Uh, and eventually AMD won. But in the meantime, it was forced to create clean room versions of the Intel microcode for X. Uh, 386 and 486 processors. And then AMD's completely first in-house x86 processor was the K5, launched in 1996. The K, in the name, interestingly, refers to kryptonite, the only substance that can harm Superman, which was Intel in this case. So the uh, K5 was AMD's kryptonite uh, in face of uh, Intel being Superman. And then from there onwards, you basically get Intel and AMD going head to head with the successive generations of 32-bit x86 uh, CPUs. Along the way, there was some skirmishes about single instruction, multiple data, SIMD instructions. Intel introduced MMX. Of course, they didn't initially license that to AMD. Uh, then there was SSE, uh, so AMD responded with 3D Now, but eventually Intel's SSE and SSE2 became the dominant standards, and both companies now even support uh, advanced vector extensions, AVX. So while these uh, extra instructions were added to one and they weren't available in the other, and there's some quite interesting stories about you know, which processors it could play which games at which performance because of all this kind of stuff. Nowadays, that thing has kind of settled down. Which then brings us to the 64-bit era. So at the turn of the century, 
the industry started to shift from 32 bits to 64 bits. However, Intel made a misstep. Even though Intel invented the x86 architecture, it wasn't the only ISA instruction set architecture that Intel used. And in an attempt to move to a better ISA than x86, Intel opted to make the jump to 64 bits using the IA64 instruction set, which is the Intel Itanium architecture, in partnership with HP Hewlett Packard. The first IA64 processor was the Itanium, released in 2001, but it was a commercial failure. Now, AMD announced AMD 64, a 64 bit extension to the x86 instruction set in 1999, and the first AMD 64 processors came out in 2003. Now, of course, the big difference from a commercial point of view was that AMD 64 was backwards compatible. So you could buy an AMD 64 processor, you could still run your existing 32-bit, even 16-bit software on it. And then if you had 64-bit software, 64-bit version of Windows, for example, 64-bit version of Linux, it would go into the 64-bit mode and run like that. But you was completely compatible. If you bought an Itanium, then it only ran Itanium. It could run 8086, but through software emulation, which means uh, it was not what people wanted. So Intel finally abandoned Itanium and the last generation was released in 2017. However, Intel saw the need to jump to 64 bits on x86 quite quickly after AMD's success uh, and the failure of Itanium. So after several years of denying it was even thinking about it, Intel announced it was working on an x86-64 ISA compatible with AMD 64 in February of 2004 and the first chip came out in 2006. The 64-bit extension to x86 has different names depending on who you're talking to. x86-64, x64, x86-64 with an underline, AMD 64, Intel 64 uh, and from here on Intel and AMD competed head-to-head -head with again successive generations now of 64-bit CPUs. Now, designing the microarchitecture of a processor is fundamental to the processor's capabilities and performance. As we saw, if it's 64-bit, it's built into its design, its microarchitecture. However, how it's manufactured is also an important aspect. Now, I have a video here on this channel explaining how microprocessors are manufactured. I do hope you've had a chance to see that or that you'll watch this uh, after this uh, video. Now, the key metric, if you haven't seen that video, is something called the process node. How small the transistors are on the die, on the silicon uh, wafer. Each node represents a greater transistor density. The process node is quoted in nanometers. Uh, 65 nanometers where we were in around 2005, 45 nanometers in 2007, and then you keep you know shrinking down, fast forward to 2020, 5 nanometers, 2022, 3 nanometers, and so on. At one point, it actually was an actual representation of a measurement between gates, between the transistor, that kind of thing. Nowadays, it's just, it kind of increases or, or decreases as the transistor density uh, increases. Now, Intel has its own semiconductor manufacturing business. It has traditionally made its own processors. It's often been a world leader in process manufacturing. However, it did struggle for many years to move beyond 14 nanometers. And so it kind of got stuck. There are a lot of generations of Intel chip uh, came out only on 14 nanometer because Intel was struggling to make the equipment and the processes and the technology to go smaller than that. AMD also had its own foundries. However, in 2008, it announced it planned to go fabulous and spin off its semiconductor manufacturing business to a new company, which eventually became Global Foundries. Now, of course, you don't just spin off a company and then say, off you go, go and do whatever you want. Global Foundries was built on the basis that AMD would be its principal customer. So they had a wafer supply agreement where AMD uh, agreed to buy most of its microprocessors uh, wafers from Global Foundries. And that was valid until 2024. However, things didn't go the way that AMD or Global Foundries uh, expected. So it, interestingly enough, in 2006, AMD had bought ATI. That's where it gets its GPUs from, that it's famous for now. But originally that was part of ATI. Uh, and they were already using TSMC. So that's another semiconductor manufacturing company that doesn't do design, just does manufacturing. So two years before the creation of Global Foundries, AMD were already working with another foundry 
TSMC. Now, Global Foundries slowly started to slip behind Intel and ultimately it never made the leap to seven nanometers. And so basically Intel and Global Foundries had to come to different agreements on how they could get out of this wafer supply deal. There was obviously money exchanged hands and other things like that. So starting with the second generation Zen CPU from AMD, this is in 2018, parts were made on TSMC 7 nanometer, which gave AMD an advantage because they were now at 7 nanometer. And parts of the, the chip were made still at 12, 14 nanometers in Global foundries uh, facilities and then starting with the Zen 4 in 2022 everything is now made at TSMC because global foundries basically stayed at 12 and 14 nanometer uh, and obviously the industry has moved forward since then. So what this means is that the success or failure of Intel or AMD at any particular point in history is also about the manufacturing process as it is as much about you know 64 bit or you know AVX uh, support or you know what kind of a uh, single threaded core performance they're giving you what thermal efficiency they're giving you so AMD has certainly been able to capitalize on the success of its Zen line of CPUs coupled with TSMC's process node while Intel has struggled in various areas however in terms of market share Intel is still king uh, most analysis of the market share put the spin at about 75%, 25% in favor of Intel. And of course, there are different categories. You've got desktop CPUs, laptop CPUs, server CPUs, and so on. But as a whole, there might be, you know, it might be 70%, 30%, or, you know, whatever in different segments. But overall, you're looking at a 75%, 25% split. So Intel is still king when it comes to market share. So you've now got a choice. If you want to buy a CPU, what kind of things should you look at to help you choose between Intel and AMD? Well, price performance ratio is probably the most important one if you're just a normal consumer because you want the greatest performance at the lowest price. That's, of course, what you're looking for. And so it certainly, in many, many cases, AMD do offer that. You might be looking just for raw performance. You might say, I don't care about the price. I want the best performance. And of course, you've got single core performance, multi-threaded performance. Are you just looking for a hexa-core CPU? Do you want 16 cores? You know, so you've got to choose there. At the time of making this video, kind of AMD do seem to have the highest single-threaded score, according to Geekbench. Intel's not too far behind. It depends on the clock speed, which then also leads to the cooling and the thermals, which is another thing to talk about. You might say, I want the greatest performance. I don't care about the price, but I want it to be quiet, which means I don't want such big fans on it, which means, well, you know, maybe I'm prepared to go with a slightly one that's more, you know, you need to make a choice. Sometimes oh, I'm going to go with liquid cooling. So I don't care about that. That's not a problem. You know, these are the things you have to uh, consider. And there's also the consideration of, you know, what kind of upgrade path have you got? If you pick a particular socket uh, in a motherboard, you know, is that going to be able to uh, be used by the next socket? Intel do tend to change their socket definitions quite a lot. AMDs tend to change less often. The motherboard costs, because then, of course, you've got other things like the chipsets that come with it, which may themselves come from Intel or AMD. So how are they? Are you going to get Thunderbolt? Are you going to get USB 4? Are you going to get, you know, whatever? So these are all, it's not just the CPU. There are other things to consider. Then, of course, are you getting one with integrated graphics? You might want that, for example. You might not want a dedicated uh, external uh, GPU. So, you know, this is not running for gaming. So then, of course, AMD, they're going to be able to put their GPUs in there. Intel also have their GPUs. They're not as popular. Yeah, there's all these things you have to, to think about. And then also overclocking. Are you the kind of person that wants to tweak uh, everything to get the greatest performance? If so, then you have to look. Some Intel chips are limited. You can't overclock them. Some uh, AMD ones, you can overclock much more easier. So again, these are all different things. Me personally, I'm always looking at price performance. That's just where I'm at. The other stuff really does take a secondary place to me you may be different you may be more interested in the thermals you may be more interested in the type of motherboard consider all those things then take your pick okay so there you have it love to hear your thoughts in the comments below okay that's it i'll see you in the next one